For over 30 years, the team at Hope Store New Beginning Center, along with our clients and community partners, have been building lives without violence in Dallas and Collin counties. If you're in immediate physical danger, please call 911. If you need shelter or would like to talk to someone about receiving our other free services, please call our 24-hour hotline at 972-276-0057 in English or Spanish. At Hope Store New Beginning Center, we offer free trauma-informed services for those affected by domestic abuse, battering intervention and prevention services for those who have abused their partners in the past, and free community education services for any community group or organization. Domestic abuse is a human rights issue that affects a third of all Texans. We empower victims, perpetrators, and community members to live in safety and foster healthy relationships. Please call our 24-hour hotline for help or visit hdmbc.org to learn more about our services. And don't forget to follow us on social media. Hope Store New Beginning Center. Building lives without violence. Hello, everyone. So I think, um, yeah, people are joining in slowly, so we're just going to let them trickle in. But I'm going to go ahead and start um, just with my introduction right off the, the get-go. My name is uh, Jose Romero. I'm one of the bilingual community education facilitators at Hope Store New Beginning Center. And when I first actually started this job, I was terrified of just thinking about presenting in front of teenagers because I was a teenager. I, I knew what kind of teenager I was myself. And I didn't like when people would come and speak and present, present in front of us. So I, I just knew going in, I was like, is this what these teens are gonna think about me when I do presentations in front of them? But um, I have some pictures up here I posted of some of the, of me speaking in front of some of these students and just the um, amount of joy I actually got from it and speaking to these youth, they have so much to say and they, they're so receptive to the message that we're trying to deliver to them but i just enjoyed that audience way more than i thought i was going to enjoy it and with everything going on now with the events that are going on i miss it a lot i miss being out at these high schools and presenting in front of the, the youth and getting that feedback that we're not we're, we're, we're able to get some of that through our zoom uh, webinars but it's just not the same so i do i do miss that part of my my job a lot and usually there, we come in, we do one presentation, but we also have a safe dates program where we're able to see them. It can be divided into a, either a 10, 10 week program or a six week program. But I was able to do my first one last semester and I got to see the, the, same, the same health classes 10 weeks over and over for one, one day a week for 10 weeks straight. And I was really able to build a connection with these youth. I was able to talk about some conversation or have these conversations that they haven't had with any any other adults because some of these conversations are really hard to discuss but throughout those weeks we established that bonds like hey i'm here for you we're, we're gonna talk about those awkward conversations that you know you can't have so they started opening up little by little and one of the one of the things that we that or rather i heard a lot was when it comes to LGBTQ plus IA relationships, where do we start that conversation? I had one student who honestly didn't believe that domestic violence existed outside of a male and female relationship. So that was a very big conversation that we had as, a, as an entire class because we had, we had students in that actual classroom that were part of this community. So there was no fighting or arguing or dissing anyone. It was a lot of learning about this community that some of these students really didn't know about. So it gave, it gave um, me and these students the opportunity to learn a lot more about some of the hardships that these students go through, how we can help them. So when those, um, when we're able to present in that Safe Dates program and make that connection, a lot of those conversations and a lot of new information comes up for these students to really learn. Because when we do these presentations where it might be, we just come in and do a presentation for about an hour. Yes, we're able to get a message across, but 
it's it's just it could be improved on especially if we we're able to come in multiple times but the reason i wanted to bring up uh, that little uh, segment is because this is june and this is pride month and with COVID 19 happening at the at the moment a lot of these events the parades are being canceled uh, the dallas one has been canceled uh, in person but i know they wanted to go about it in a virtual uh, virtual setting but I just wanted to include that because we are accepting and affirming of all members of the LGBT community and we're welcoming when it comes to that community as well. So I just wanted to throw that out there. When we started making the switch to the Zoom meetings, a lot of it was trial and error. We're trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work, what's the best way to approach these Zoom webinars, like how do we get it out there. So it's been a whole learning experience trying to adapt our presentations and our webinars in a more digital setting. So we're able to present them and we know things don't always go right. Like if you see that maybe my audio isn't working, if it starts cutting off, please feel free to let me know in the chat so we can get that sorted out. But it's just the chat box is going to be there open for you if you have any questions throughout the presentation as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So at Hope Store, our mission is, is um, we provide intervention and prevention services to those affected by intimate part, part family and partner violence. So this is what the, the, our mission at HCNBC is. I am part of the education department. I know some of you here, uh, some of the participants and attendees here today have seen some of our prior presentations. So I'm not gonna bore you again with, um, with our organization and what we do at the beginning. I'm gonna save that for later so we can cover more, uh, more of the important topics that we're gonna discuss today. But I'll leave that towards the end. But I am part of the education department and, and what we're trying to do is we promote healthy relationships and empower community members of all ages to understand, prevent, and respond effectively to all forms of abuse. And we're gonna be talking about teen dating violence and that is, um, as it's defined, it is a pattern of behavior that includes physical, emotional, verbal, digital, sexual, and financial abuse I mentioned financial abuse, and when I talk to our high school students, I usually say, I ask them, like, how many of you here are currently working? And I don't receive a lot of hands that go up. I might have some of the seniors or juniors that have their hands go up. We know teens are susceptible to financial abuse. It's just at a lesser scale because, again, a lot of them aren't working at the time, but we know it does still occur, and we'll talk about that here in a bit. Another thing is, what is the difference between teen dating violence and adult intimate, intimate partner violence is one of the big things. And there's three main points. And teenagers um, usually depend on their guardian for financial uh, income. For um, It's usually their parents or their guardian who's in charge of giving them a place to stay. They're not dependent on their boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other for that housing. So that, that's one element where adult and teen uh, domestic violence uh, different, differs. Another one is uh, lack of experience. Um, when it comes to teens, they probably haven't encountered that many relationships where they see a lot of these patterns. So they're still thinking when my significant other is sweeping me off my feet and romancing me with all of this information they might not know, hey, okay, this is too good to be true. I need to slow it down. But they're just swept in those emotions so that uh, this feels good. And they like that experience that maybe an adult has already gone through some of, some of these encounters. So they're just less, less experienced in that, in that aspect when it comes to dating. And last one is uh, teen relationships are heavily influenced by their peers. When it, the, the way you could see this is um, I had one of the students actually tell me she was dating the varsity quarterback at their high school and she was putting up with a lot of the abusive relationship um, signs like he would yell at her, he would tell her who she's able to hang out with, who she's not allowed to have uh, as friends, any male guys she wasn't allowed to have. But when it comes to her peers, her friends, her best friends, they would all tell her, it's okay. It's not that bad because at least you're dating the quarterback. You know, he's a starting quarterback. So it's not that bad. You can put up with a little few things in there. So she decided to stay in that relationship because her peers 
those people that care about her were telling her, this is good for you, okay? So while yes, a, a little side of him might not be the greatest thing, look at what it's bringing to you and your, and your, and your um, social standing at school. You're the starting quarterback's girlfriend. So it's situations like that where it differs. And when you see that in adults, it, the, the, that difference is, is in particularly there because um, adults are actually looking, you're looking out for your, your friends when they're in that toxic relationship. You're not telling them, oh, but downplaying it or anything like that. You see that a lot more in teenagers. One of the things that we did this this month in February, which is uh, Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. Um, our organization took part in a lot of, or our education department, uh, we had a lot of presentations, a lot of events that we were doing to cover throughout that month. We were very, that was one of our uh, very busiest months that we had to go and what that would look like is um, we're just trying to bring awareness and it's at a national scale. There's teenagers doing little things that they can do to bring awareness, but at the same time, at the same time, you're seeing organizations do the same thing. And so this year, uh, Respect Week actually actually fell between uh, Monday the 10th and and um, Friday the 14th, which which was Valentine's Day. So throughout that week, we had bookings where we would go out and speak and bring awareness. Um, on Tuesdays, so you can see here was Wear Orange Day, and when I did a presentation that day. I was wearing that orange. It's not a color you see often. And you would see uh, some of these teens as, hey, why are you wearing orange? And it would give me the opportunity to open up, hey, this is what, what this month is about. This is the awareness we're trying to bring to educate just the population on what's going on because we know teens go through domestic violence. We know it happens to you as well. We see it like when we're out there doing these presentations, the number of students that come up and tell us afterwards, like, how did you know I was going through that? It's like you're sitting right there in that living room when all that abuse between my parents was going on. So we're just trying to give them that platform where they can share those, those experiences, positive messages with one another. And here you can see our lovely staff actually took part in, in uh, Respect Week. And this is just our staff here wearing orange and being supportive with some of the signs. But I want to talk a little bit about um, the early socialization when it comes to, to youth, because again, youth are heavily influenced by their peers, but not only peers, you have families, you have religious groups. It's anything and anyone can really influence what, um, what the teen's uh, thought process is going to be as they start growing older. And I'm going to play a video for us. And I know, again, some of y'all have seen this video and I don't want to bore you out to death with it but I wanted to take a different approach today and pretty much tell you what, well, with these two videos that I have once a little bit later, but I wanna give you the approach on how the teens that I show this video in front of see it, what their questions are, what their concerns are. So I'm gonna play that for you right here. So when I play that video, and it wraps up in these, I asked these high school students, so what do you think about that video? I get one or two, one of two reactions. I get that was very cute. It was so lovely. It, it's sending a positive message. And then I get the other half that groans once they hear this, like, uh, what are you talking about? And I ask them, so what what what, what is it you didn't like about it? Why why are you groaning at that? And they're like, because they were just touching her. They some random guy just asked them to touch her and they did it. They didn't ask for consent is what it came down to. And it makes uh, a, most of these high school students cringe. We don't give these students enough credit because they are very aware of what's going on around in our community. In that situation, it opened up that conversation. It's like, well, they were probably, they're, they're, the director, who, the, the person who was behind the, that camera probably had, it was a controlled experiment where they had these youth come in. But at the same time, these high school students would tell us, well, you shouldn't have to, you shouldn't do anything you're told by a random stranger. And especially when it comes to touching someone else, regardless, consent always comes into play. And that's very important when it comes to teenagers. Um, being able to feel comfortable around other individuals, other peers, especially when it comes to consent is very important, to, very important to them in that, in that aspect, especially in relationships is one of the other things 
uh, students have shared it's like even because even if I'm in a relationship with someone it doesn't give them the right to just freely touch me like that like they still have to ask for consent and that comment went to buy half of the class is like what are you talking about what do you mean like that's your boyfriend they they have permission to hold your hand and and touch you and wrap their arms around you and when it comes to to that relationship we know there's still some work to to be done there when it comes to teens because yes you might be going out with this individual but again that does not give you the right to touch them whenever you please like that to hold them to just Put your arm around them like they're your property that they belong to you because there's a difference when it comes to that and getting teenagers to understand that is a bit tough when it comes to, to that aspect of getting them to understand that yes a relationship is me and you going out together but at the same time it doesn't give you the freedom to just freely like abuse me like that in that aspect it's one of the more common things we see but then at the same time um another another one of the more common things that i hear is well why wasn't why why didn't they switch the the roles why couldn't they pick a guy to be in the, to be there in place of martina and then have three four other girls so reverse the roles how would how would that make the boy feel if they were touching him he'd probably like it he'd probably be fine with that so it it, it falls and that's where that fine line starts falling with those gender stereotypes and how males how females are perceived when when these teenagers tell me that they're like well he should be so lucky if if, it, if that was a guy and it comes to those relationships he should be so lucky even if a girl is touching him without consent it's good for him but you reverse the roles no it's not perfectly fine so that's when it comes to again those gender stereotypes it's a fine line again that we're trying to get a lot of these youth to understand and one of the other common ones that we see too is the color that's usually associated with a boy is typically blue when you pick a color for a girl that color is usually pink but what happens if a young boy just happens to like the color pink what does society say about this student it's usually frowned upon there's something wrong with him he, he he's probably he probably likes other other boys and it's that fine line where we've society has drawn these strict little stereotypes on uh, for each gender and the moment you step away and then you you're steering away from the lane you're supposed to be in there's something wrong with you and that's something we're trying to work again with teens to let them know that it's perfectly fine if you're a male it's perfectly fine to show other emotions aside from just anger just just being angry and pent up with rage it's perfectly fine to be sad be emotional quiet it's, there's nothing wrong with that and the same thing for a young lady if a young lady ever shows that emotion of anger society says oh there's something wrong with her too stay away from her she's crazy no it's perfectly fine for for a young lady to show that emotion as well so these are just some of the things we like i've heard constantly from youth and, and that this video brings out and i just wanted to share that with you when it comes to that aspect in that video just a different take on it and here i have uh, a 911 phone call by a six year old named lisa and again i'm going to i'm going to share the same the we're going to dissect it just like i did the previous one where I tell you the information that I usually get and the comments that I receive from the the, two, the teens that watch these videos, actions that we do get. But after that initial shock, I get I get a few things that that they tell me. First was why did the dispatcher assume that the father, the husband, was the abuser right off the get go? Because when Lisa does make that that call, the dispatcher immediately says, "What is he doing to her? Or what? It, how is he hurting her?" and i explained to them domestic violence domestic abuse can happen to anyone it just so happens that women suffer at much higher rates that that assumption that this uh dispatcher may just happen to be right this time but we know males do suffer as well but again females just do suffer at much higher rates the second thing that we get is like well why did the dispatcher sound so calm so sound so relaxed when it came to this and the answer to that is they're trained that way they're trained to be relaxed and calm because if you were in a situation similar to Lisa's and you're calling the dispatcher for help and the dispatcher starts freaking out as well, odds are you're going to hang up that phone. So they're trained to act that way. So it's not, it's not because they're not being sympathetic to the situation that's going on. They're just 
trying to make sure you stay on the line with them. And then <clears throat> one of the other ones is, well, the dad knew that there was a baby in the picture. The young girl, Lisa, was yelling, screaming. She was on the phone with the cops, yet that still didn't stop him? What, what gives? And you would think any person in the right mind would say, okay, I need to stop this. Like, this isn't right and catch yourself, like stop yourself. But odds are this husband has clearly gotten away with this before. It's probably not his first time that he had been abusing uh, Lisa's mom. So I just let him know, yeah, it's most likely he had just gotten away with this and he feels the need to, like since he has gotten away with it, he feels in control. He has that power and control over Lisa's mom where he feels it's, it's my right to treat her this way and there's nothing anyone can do about it. Because again, those police officers were on their way and that didn't seem to stop them. Did Lisa's uh, screaming stop her? No. Did the fact that there was a baby in the picture involved stop them? No. So it's just things that uh, these teenagers are picking out from, from these clips. And again, I wasn't like when I first showed this video, I wasn't expecting to get that much of a response from teenagers uh, after listening to this audio. It's like they're very, they're, they're, they pick out little things that we don't think, again, we're not giving them enough credit when it comes to these situations. And when it comes to teenagers witnessing abuse, especially in the households, just because maybe you're not, like, they're not the ones being directly abused, they're not the ones getting beat, but they're there and they're seeing it, they're witnessing all that, that still affects these teenagers, okay? And in, in relation to this video, a teen girl who grows up in that environment witnessing that abuse is 10 times likely to actually end up in an abusive relationship herself just because it has been normalized to her. She thinks this is what a relationship looks like. So if I end up in a relationship as a teenager and my partner is abusing me just like my dad was abusing my mom, that's perfectly fine because that's what parents do. So it just normalizes that behavior. And for young boys, they're six, time li six times likely to actually become the perpetrator themselves again because it had that those actions have been normalized to them. That's what they see growing up. So they think this is perfectly fine in a relationship. And as they grow older, that's where uh, their, action, their actions usually uh, uh, send them towards, okay? And we're going to talk about a little bit of what those healthy relationships actually look like. Healthy communication, like when, when teenagers ask me, okay, Jose, so what do you think in your relationship, like, or the relationships you've had, what do you think is the most important thing? And I always come back to healthy communication. Being able to talk about your problems, if there's an issue that arises in your relationship, if you're able to address that that concern, that issue, that fight, that like, and address it then and there, instead of letting it just just simmer up together right before you explode and just just setting it to a side, that that's one thing that I always tell them. It's it's very important in that relationship because your partner is not a mind reader. You can't expect for them to know why you're upset or what little things set you off and the same for them they can expect that from you so being able to have that healthy uh, line of communication back and forth is very vital to that uh, healthy relationship with teens and again with them a lot of that i get is like no he or she's supposed to know what why i'm upset it's not the first time they do it so they should know and that's not the way we want to go about it you should be able to speak up and be honest and have those uh, conversations, even, even though they might be hard to have at times, it's still part of what a relationship is. And in order to maintain it and make, sh make sure it nourishes, that communication, uh, it, it has to be um, integrated into that relationship. Mutual respect, this we, and it comes down to respecting your partner's uh, values, ideas, and their privacy as well. And that means when Let's say they step out and they leave their cell phone. You're not in there trying to figure out what their password is, trying to figure out what their pattern is. You're not trying to do any of that. You, you respect their privacy and they respect yours. Healthy boundaries. Um, not banning your friend or your partner from hanging out with their friends, with their circle of friends at all, giving them the 
the, the time that they need to uh, be part of, of their circle of friends, you know, spend time with them. Like you don't always have to be there. They don't have a, or always have to be there either when you're hanging out with your circle of friends. It's perfectly fine to let them do their own thing with their own uh, circle of friends. And this actually ties down with individuality down here because you're allowed to be your own person in this relationship. Just because you two are together doesn't mean you become the same identical person. No, you're still gonna have your own ideas, beliefs, the same with your partner. They're gonna care about certain things. They're gonna have their own hobbies, their own interests. And you should be able to have your own interests as well when it comes to, when it comes to that uh, trust. Another important one to a lot of teenagers when it comes to this, I, uh, it's I need to be able to make sure I can trust my partner. I don't need to fear that they're out there cheating. I don't need to hear that there's rumors out there. So again, trust is established over time in those relationships. And how do you make sure you maintain that trust? Healthy communication, being able to talk back and forth. Again, if you heard rumors that your significant other is out there probably like holding hands with some other random stranger, are you going to immediately going to, are you just going to go blow up and beat up this other, other random mystery person? No, that's not how you address that. That's not how you should address that. That's the answer I get though, from a lot of these teenagers. I know we're going to go post up. We're going to do something about this situation. How is my partner out there cheating on me? No, I'm going to show their other partner that I mean business. And that's not how we want these teens to address those problems again. So and anger control, very important. You want to you want to make sure that these teens are able to release that in a healthy manner. If they want to go out and take a kickbox uh, kickboxing class to let out that anger, that is perfectly fine. There is nothing wrong with that. That is a healthy, uh, just a healthy way to let out that anger. You don't want them to hold on to all that uh, aggression building up inside and again, letting it just explode and clouding their judgment at the worst time where it can get them in, in worse trouble. So being able to help them when it comes to controlling their anger in a healthy manner is very important in that relationship. And, and it shows that, yeah, if your partner is controlling their anger and just letting it on those safe manners, that shows that you have those positive uh, a, a very positive partner when it comes to your relationship problem solving this isn't always like you i mentioned where when it comes to a relationship you are you are there in it together but you can't be your own individual person when it comes to problem solving at the same time you shouldn't think that oh i need to solve everything i need to fix everything you should be able to rely on your partner and they should be able to rely on you and come to you for solutions on how to resolve some some common issues you might be going through as well so again another sign of a healthy relationship and last but not least we have a healthy sexual relationship as well not forcing them not expecting them to to have intercourse maybe they said they were ready they were going to be ready at, by prom prom comes around they don't feel comfortable with the situation not forcing them okay not not guilting them into well you promised me once prom came around we were going to finally have intercourse no okay that's not a sign of a good relationship but respecting they have they have all the right like, to change their mind that's perfectly fine and when a person is willing to accept them, it's like, okay, okay, you know what? I'm not going to force you to it. That's when we see a healthy relationship. But then we also have those, the other side of the coin, which is the unhealthy relationships and control. What do perpetrators want? They want power and control over individuals. When you see that one partner in this relationship is the one that's making all of the decisions, that's when we start seeing some of those uh, little red flags because they're slowly trying to isolate their their partner from their support system hostility picking fights just to just to antagonize their their partner is another one you should never or rather when it comes to that hostility you should never try like teenagers when it comes to that they shouldn't do, be doing that on purpose okay that that's one of those bigger signs that we see that I'm, that, that these teenagers share with me it's like well my significant other just picks a fight just to fight and they find it funny that is not a good sign of a healthy relationship at all, okay? So that's one of those red flags that, that teenagers see a lot, but they kind of just steer from it. Uh, 
dishonesty, lying, uh, ste or even stealing from the partner. Another one of the common ones uh, that I hear about um, disrespect makes fun of your interests and opinions. And the way we're seeing there, or I was seeing this before the COVID-19 stuff is I was being told that a lot of these students were recording videos for TikTok, for their Facebook, for their Snapchat, you name it, making fun of their partner or just getting them riled up by and making fun of something that they really cared about just to see that shock experience and capture it on, uh, on video to put out there just for the likes and the views. And again, that's not what a healthy relationship looks like. Physical violence and downplaying what that looks like. Maybe you're shoving someone and pulling them at a party because it's time to go and they're being yanked and, and pulled out of the party. Again, another one of those signs that it's, it's very visible, but a lot of teens downplay that a lot because it's like, okay, yeah, he grabbed my wrist and he yanked me, but he didn't leave any bruises or any marks, so I'm okay. So teenagers downplay that, even though that is an, um, like one of those bigger red flags that you start seeing in relationships as well. And then sexual violence is uh, when they're forcing themselves again, when they're not asking for consent. One of the bigger red flags that we see as well in those unhealthy relationships. I've done a few presentations in front of parents where I've, I've had the mind that like just, some some of the section just tell me, well, it doesn't happen that much to teenagers. It's not that common. It's like teenagers are still learning. They're shy. They're not in relationships as much. So they're not big of a, like as big as a problem. And we know that's not true. I did a presentation at a second chance high school where I I was there speaking for, for I did probably five six different classes and. The first class I did, I had this student who was very vocal. Anytime I asked any questions, what do you think about that? It's like, how does that make you feel? He was on top of it. He, he would, he, it, it's, like, it's like he saw this presentation and he knew exactly what he had to say. So I didn't question him. I didn't address him. I didn't point him out or anything. But throughout the, the rest of the day, I noticed, okay, this kid clearly, like, like He's, he's probably seen something or he's gone through something himself. So at the end of my final presentation, I was actually wrapping up my things in the classroom and I had him walk in to the classroom I was at. And he's like, hey, Jose, can I talk with you for a second? And I'm like, yeah, sure, what's up? And he started telling me how his girlfriend at the time was very aggressive with him. She was just physically aggressive. She would scratch him with her nails. She would bite him. She would kick him, punch him. But he didn't feel that that was, uh, that that was abuse just because he said, but it didn't hurt. It never hurt. She couldn't hurt me. Like anything she did, it just didn't hurt. So I didn't think that was abuse. But we were talking about it and, and he showed me he had some long sleeves on and then he showed he rolled up one of his sleeves and he showed me this big bite mark that he had right on his forearm and it was still healing he had bandages that he built to show me and it was that was the final straw where it made him realize okay this is abuse this th there is something wrong with that a partner shouldn't have you fearing for your well-being or have your uh, have you defending yourself 24 seven because you don't know what they're gonna be capable of doing. That's not a sign of a healthy relationship, especially with teenagers. They should feel safe with their significant other. When they're having a walk on eggshells, watch what they say or just be on high alert to make sure that their partner isn't gonna do some, some show some signs of aggression. That's when, that, that's when it finally clicked for, for this student. And he started telling me of, how he ended up getting to the second chance high school because he told me I was at Lake Highlands before so that's where I've actually done some of my safe dates program and the teacher the, the classroom that he was in at the time is actually the same uh, the the same instructor that I've worked with in the past before and I I opened up the the door with that teacher once I saw him next time and I was just discussing it with him and he's like, yeah, like we see it happening. Like we were giving him the advice, letting him know that these aren't the signs yet he still decided to just ignore those, uh, ignore those signs. So 
he ended up getting um, the assistance he needed, the help he needed, and the message really, really got through to this uh, team when, when I last started uh, or last had a, that conversation with him. So when parents when, uh, tell me that it's not that common, it just, it, 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 it hurts. It hurts to hear that, that some adults don't think that teen dating is that common because we know it is true. We know that one in three teenagers go through some form of abuse. And that violent, violent behavior usually starts between the ages of 12 and 18, year, 18 years old. So we're trying to, that's why we're trying to get ahead of it because we know the sooner we're able to get in, get the message across through to these teens, uh, we're able to either help stop some of the abuse that they're going through or even help revert some of their thought process of, of what their um, mind or their state um, state being might be at the time like what they're thinking that they think this is proper behavior we're able to stop that in its tracks and we're able to hopefully help some of these teens in that aspect now this is another one of the things we ask uh, teenagers a lot and i'm gonna i'm gonna give you all the answer for this one but um when when we ask them out of if i were to ask you or say that 10 young ladies were in a relationship and let's say out of let's say all 10 of them were to be physically beat just once by their partner. How many, how many of them would stay? I get, I get usually one, zero, five, like three, I get the, on the lower end and I wish it was zero. Every time I hear that, I'm like, I wish I could run myself out of job, out of a job. So, cause then I, I would know everyone gets it, that these teens get it, that adults get it, that this is a real problem. But unfortunately, we know that's not the case. Like eight out of 10 of those girls would stay in that uh, relationship even if they were just beat once. And then uh, the follow-up question is why though? Why would someone stay in a relationship knowing that they're gonna be physically abused or degraded, called names or anything? And there's multiple different reasons for uh, someone staying in a relationship and just um, some of the ones, um, some of the more common ones or answers I get from teenagers is love. I loved him. This was my first boyfriend or girlfriend. They sweep me right off my feet. Like they, they only did it one time. It's, they told me it's never going to happen again. So that's one reason I would stay. Shame and embarrassment. That young student, uh, the young student I was sharing that story about just earlier, that's what he told me. I know it didn't hurt, but at the same time, I wasn't going to, he told me he wasn't going to tell any of his friends, any, any of his homeboys at all, because he knew the moment he told his homeboys that his girlfriend was kicking him, punching him, biting him, they would tell him, they would make fun of him, and they would tell him, well, put her in her place. Why aren't you doing anything about the situation? You're a man, aren't you? Fix it. Stop her from doing that. And he knew that, and he was terrified of going to, to his circle of friends his, his homies that, tell him, that, that were telling him, oh, we're always going to be there for you regardless what. But that same circle of friends is going to be the first one that's going to jump down his throat when it comes to that. So that embarrassment, it really, it, it really plays into keeping a, a victim in these relationships as well. Fear of loneliness. I don't want to be alone after my self-esteem is, uh, self is chipped away. Who else is going to want me? No, I'm just going to stay with this individual instead. So we get multiple reasons for that relationship uh, violence affects all it's not just a, a teenager problem we know it can affect anyone and everyone so it's one of those few things in life that isn't going to discriminate at all and dating abuse again we know it's a choice and it aims to gain that power and control over an individual and it's not an anger management issue it's and as a matter of fact it's also not an intoxication issue and one of the best ways I, I get that point across with, with our youth, with our teenagers is um, because most of them start, um, are, are driving, they have vehicles, they have driver's permit at that, at that age. And I ask them, let's say, so if, it, if you were driving down I-30 and let's say you got a speeding ticket by a police officer, if this police officer gave you that ticket, how did that make you feel? And they usually go angry, mad, it's like, would you punch that police officer? I'm like, no, of course not. Okay. So how's that any any different than 
when it comes to situations like this. Just because you're upset at the situation doesn't mean you're going to go out and punch someone just because you're upset or angry. No, and the same thing applies to uh, relationships. Just because you're upset your partner said something doesn't warrant them getting punched or get them getting abused in that situation. So we know it's not an anger management issue. And at the same time, we do hear a lot of, well, my dad was drunk and he just beat up my wife because he was drunk. That, uh, that's why he, uh, he punched her. But if that was the case, wouldn't he also punch everyone at that bar before he came home and decided to punch the, his wife? So we know it's not an intoxication issue. It was a choice, okay? Now I have this activity that we have here that we play with the students, but I'm actually just gonna uh, move forward to the next section. We're gonna skip this one out just because I see I'm actually running out of time and I don't wanna hold everyone here. But we're gonna talk about some of the, the other forms of abuse real quick. We have uh, the verbal the verbal abuse, which is one of, uh, one of the more common ones that teenagers see a lot. And, and that's when they're using those words, um, they're using to hum humiliate them. And one of the tactics that abusers use, uh, they use that to destroy their victim self-esteem because they know the moment you start chipping away at someone's self-esteem, they're not gonna wanna go anywhere because one of the reasons again, loneliness. My partner is not going to want to, probably not want to be alone. So the moment I chip away at that self-esteem, they have no choice but to stay in this relationship because who else is going to want them? So that's one of the tactics you see. And it'd be like, you're lucky to have me. No one else will want you. So where are you going to go? Then you see emotional abuse. And then one of the tactics uh, that you see a lot is uh, perpetrators use that that emotional abuse with, when it comes to self-harm. If you break up with me, I'm gonna hurt myself, I'm gonna commit suicide. So they use that to keep their potential partner in that relationship because they know their partner isn't gonna uh, want to feel responsible for any harm that might arise. So that's a way that they're, they're able to keep them in that relationship. Digital abuse now, unfortunately, when it comes to devices like tablets, phones, all that technology, it, I'll be the first one to tell you, I love my technology, I can't live without it. I have my phone here, I have my laptop there, I have, I'm just, I have it readily available and so do teenagers. If I finish a presentation, maybe a few, five minutes early before presentation, the teacher will tell them, okay guys, y'all have the next five minutes free time and Everybody's looking down, they're on their phones, and it's quiet. It's that silent. When I was in high school, everybody was yelling, screaming. The teacher would have to tell us to be quiet. But that's not the case nowadays. Everybody is just on their phones. So they're always connected. They're always online. They're always trying to gain those media likes from, from those social media sites. But, oh, I just noticed I had the wrong slide up. I'll come back to the sexual abuse, but for digital abuse is what I, back, back to that is they're always online, they're always connected. And it leaves them way more prone because they're so dependent on, uh, on that uh, technology. But one, one way this digital abuse is, um, or one of the tactics that a perpetrator uses digital abuse or how they use it is by revealing, revealing uh, or threatening to reveal maybe intimate pictures that their partner sent them when when they were in that in that puppy love stage. So if you break up with me, I'm gonna make sure those those pictures you sent me, those nude pictures, get out to the entire public. I'm gonna put them on your on your social media. I'm gonna tag you in it. I'm gonna send them to my circle of friends and everything. So that's another way they use that digital abuse to make sure that that their partner stays in that relationship and doesn't want to leave. But um Back to the sexual abuse now, the proper screen uh, that I had up here. I asked my teens, well, aside from sexual assault and, and rape, what are other ways? Like, I, like what, what do y'all think sexual abuse looks like? And some of the answers I get from them are being touched in a way you don't like without permission. Again, very important for them. The, the consent, when it comes into play, they know that's one of the boundaries that they set for themselves and they know is very important to other partners. But um, other things that we might not think of is being being forced to sell those revealing, revealing pictures on websites. 
because it's easy for them to set up accounts and just put that they're 18 years old, even though they're underage, and their partner forces them to maybe just post pictures on there and set up that account with that, which is connected to one of their, like to one of those automated um, Visa gift cards or one of those, but exploiting them, exploiting their partners in that way, um, sexual harassing uh, someone, maybe even um, sexting someone where they don't want to be part of that conversation, but where they're being sent those uh, unsolicited nudes or they're being sent those text, text messages. And at the, at the end of the presentation, I'm actually going to send to you, send um, everyone a link with uh, upcoming webinars because we do have an upcoming webinar on sexting one on one next week, but I'll, uh, I'll attach that with a follow up email at the end of the presentation. But we also have physical abuse. This is one of the more common ones that the teenagers know what this looks like and we all know what this looks like as well. But then we also have, or rather, let me touch on the other one that uh, we don't touch or we don't discuss much, which is the financial abuse because at at that age, when teenagers are around 13, 14, 15, 16, they, they, they're starting those part-time jobs. They have the allowance from their parents for doing chores around the house. You see that financial abuse where they're expected, their partner expects for them to pay for all their dates. They never pitch in, but it's expected from, from one team to pay for all their, the dates, or they're forced to buy presents for their partner. And they'll get upset if they don't get those presents or they tell them how they should be spending their money. No, don't buy those clothes. Those are tacky. This is what you should buy instead. When the teen's income is being controlled, that's when we see that financial abuse. And again, it's not that common just because not a lot of them have jobs or have income coming in, but it is still something that happens to them. And some of the long lasting effects that we see, we see substance abuse use when it comes to some of these, um, some of these, uh, forms of abuse, they do turn to substances because that's how they cope. That's how they relax. That's how, that's what they choose to, to use. Insomnia, nightmares, just having um, difficulties with sleeping, anxiety, developing PTSD, just having flashbacks to situations that might have happened. It's just how it affects a, a teen moving forward after being abused in one of those forms. And again, these individuals want that power and control to make their victim feel the way uh, they want them to. And I have uh, the power control wheel here. I'll touch on this briefly, but this is uh, essentially just your relationship if it's based off of any of these intimidation, coercion, male privilege, economic abuse, or just using the children, that's when you start seeing that, okay, this is an unhealthy relationship, that this is, this is not what you want to see in your relationship being threatened by taking away your kids. If you don't stick around in this relationship, then that's a form of abuse. And these, again, it's, this is a wheel and it goes more into detail on there on what that actually looks like. But setting boundaries, this is very, um, something we try to discuss a lot with our teenagers because we know these are very important before entering the relationship because if you know yourself, you're going to be able to define what you stand for, what you're willing to put up with, what you're not willing to put up with. Because we have some teenagers that tell us, hey, Jose, in our relationship, my, me and my partner, we cuss at each other 24-7. And that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But then you have some other students that, uh-uh, I wouldn't let my significant other call me a B or, 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 or just call me all these other terms. Uh-uh. So teens are able to set those boundaries for themselves. And it's very important, again, because once they're able to set those for themselves, they know what a good potential partner might look like and what a not uh, unhealthy partner might look like as well. And how to help someone. How, how can, can, can we help them? Some of the things we've actually seen in some of these high schools are anonymous reporting where if I'm worried about my friend, I can put uh, write down uh, their name write down uh, what the problem is and you put it in this box at the front office where then some of these counselors will go out there and make sure that the, this team is okay they'll check up on them it's like hey somebody somebody wrote um wrote one of the anonymous cards and i'm just here checking out, up on you and even some of the middle schools i've been to have implemented applications 
where students will download them on their phone and if they know their friends going through something they'll just instantly put up like file or fill out the little report and they're able to address that like immediately so counselors and schools are getting on top of that when it comes to helping someone and one of the important things when it comes to when you suspect that your friend might be going through something or your teen might be going through something it's just ask 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 it's very important because maybe they're not going to open up then and there but they'll see it's like hey this person obviously cares about me so when i'm good and ready i'm most likely going to open up to this person that showed concern that that was worried about me okay and at the same time being able to stay connected with them keeps that that um keeps them from becoming isolated because again that's what the perpetrators want that only benefits the perpetrator so just being able to stay in touch with them is very beneficial for uh when when it comes to helping someone tell them abuse is not okay it's never okay no one ever deserves that okay it's never their fault either so we don't ever want to make the blame because the moment we blame someone for the abuse it's like okay well what were you wearing if you weren't wearing that skirt so shirt you probably wouldn't have been sexually abused that is the last thing you want to tell someone that needs help because they'll shut you off then and there we know this i can't come to this person at all so why on earth are they going to disclose to anyone if they feel like they're always going to be blamed for something that happened to them so again never make them blame someone direct them to resources i have a few at the end that i'll that i'll share as well but when it comes to it, just let them know, like the one of the most simple things to you can do if somebody does come to you for help, just thank them. Thank them for coming to you and, and, and letting them know that you appreciate the fact that they see that you're someone that can help them in that situation. Even if it's just listening to someone or making them feel safe, that's sometimes all that they need when it comes to, to getting help. Just let them know that you're, the situation that you're going through is very important. To, to you as well, okay? This is one of the resources we have. We have our 24 seven hour hotline where it's answered in English and in Spanish uh, as well. And if they just need a talk, this is one of the, the resources we, we have for them as well. But um, I see I'm running out of time here. So I'm actually gonna forward or skip a little bit right up to towards the end to give you those resources real quick. Um, Two of the more common resources that we use a lot, um, Break the Cycle and Love is Respect. They have these uh, amazing quizzes that you can use with teens to let them know, are they the toxic partner relationship? Is my partner toxic? And it's simple little questions with about 10, 10, um, 10 questions. And they're able to see if their partner's traits or qualities are toxic or if they're healthy or unhealthy. So it's just little quizzes on there that that help them uh, helps open their eyes in that aspect but also has uh, a lot of other activities a lot of a lot of other information when it comes to especially our the teen dating violence awareness month that has how you can get involved in that aspect as well but um i'm going to put out leave out my information right here because i know we're at three o'clock right now and i don't want to keep anyone but if anyone has any questions or anything we can clear up please feel free so write down your question, questions in, in the chat box and then we can address it um, uh, then and there. But if not, thank you everyone so much who joined us today. I hope you were able to take out something from today's uh, webinar and just stay, uh, stay tuned because or keep an eye on your, your uh, email because I'm gonna send up uh, a follow up with these resources. And I know I was asked on the presentation if someone can get a copy, so I'll have that sent out but uh, if there's no other questions, then thank you everyone for joining me today.